Well, hello, everybody. So like Paul said, my name is Martin, and I work as a senior environment artist. So today was, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare this. So my plan was to go over some, some basic uh, techniques to effectively create an environment. And then most of the time will go off questions, I think is a good idea. So yeah, this is the, my latest environment. So how, what my approach is to, I wanted to start with uh, shady creation. Because I think that's one of the most important things in a workflow for an envi workflow for an environment. And I wanted to uh, kind of tell you about my philosophy behind it and my approach to it. So if we go in here. So I assume everybody knows what a master material is and what an instance material is. But here I go. So I have a few here. And instead of making one or two big shaders that uh, do everything, I make a few more that do specific things, which gave, gives more overview to what I, what I do. If I open up this one, and also what I keep in mind is that I try to keep it simple. So even though there's a lot of stuff, but let's see. So I start, this is the basic one. And from this one, I build everything out. So if you get your basic shader in first, then you can uh, expand on that after. Does that make sense? So as you can see, I have here the base textures then some controls, and then it goes into a material attributes. And I combine that with dust, and then it goes into the, in the actual material. And these things are just to make it blending easier. So this is basically, this is the shader on, on itself, and this one as well. And then you combine them here based on the dust position. This stuff you don't really need to care about right now. It's mainly about this. So once I have this, I go in here and then go to the next one, which is a little bit more complicated. Then I add moss to it. And the moss I can paint in because I did a vertex uh, paint stuff here. As you can see, the, the base is still the same. So I start once and then I expand on it. And you can do this uh, also with material instances, but when I made this, I didn't know there was a thing yet. I only re recently learned that. But then it's even easier, because then you can put all this into one node and just put it in every shader you're making. And that's kind of like my philosophy behind it, so how I build it up. And then I wanted to go about, so how did I create a floor? So that's also an interesting thing. So this floor is not UV mapped. It's, it's projecting a world space. So if I move it up here, if I move the floor itself, you can see that the, the texture doesn't uh, change. It just stays in the world. It's super useful for floors because that way I don't, I can just update the shape of the floor, but I don't have to UV map it all the time. And that looks kind of like this. This is a more elaborate shader, as you can see. But it's it's still the same, same kind of philosophy behind it. So it's super basic. Three texture inputs goes into one material attribute. And that we combine a few times here. The combining a few times here is because uh, there is RGB color vertex painting. By the way, is there any feedback from the chat? Like if somebody doesn't understand something, I can elaborate more? Or is there another thing, Paul? I think at the minute, yeah, there's lots of questions in the, the, the sort of channel above us. So I think if you go through stuff and then at the end, we can kind of maybe like if people have questions, go back okay. and, and look okay. in there. Yeah. Because I can imagine that for some people, that's like super overwhelming <laughs> what's going on here. You're doing great. Okay. So yeah, but uh, the whole whole trick of this shader is that it is a uh, real world space. It's basically only this. This goes into the UVs. And I added a custom rotator. So I can rotate this 45 degrees. And then this one is like 90 degrees. You can see here's the line. Why do you have four, four inputs, Martin? Uh, 
That is because there's one for the floor itself. So there's stone. Then there, on top of there, there's dirt. Then there's moss. And there is dust. Okay. And then later, here you add the puddles. Goes on top. So that's 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 why I can paint moss where I want and all the dirt and moss and dust and stuff. Okay. So it's basically like a simplified train material where you can paint on a train. I think that's more familiar for people. But then on just a plane, on any plane that has vertice. If I go in uh, wireframe mode, it's really hard to see this way. As you can see, the plane has. Uh, faces here and that's where the vertex paint is stored maybe we can go even in this and you can see here so this is all the different paint and every paint represents a other texture that's sampling on top yeah okay, i can't can't go wrong with polis of course so you need it in there too i agree <laughs> uh yeah so the the vertex paint is uh, done here, and I do the. You can do this with multiple height maps. I, I chose to do just do it with one to keep it simple. It, it again comes back to, especially when it comes to portfolio piece for myself, is always keep it as simple as possible. Because my goal is not to uh, be a technical artist. My goal is to make an environment that will impress people. If for instance, if you want to apply for a company. That's kind of my philosophy behind that. Of course, it's good to also know your technical stuff, but it's kind of pick your battles. It's kind of the idea behind it. But yeah, this goes into a height lerp, and based on the vertex paint, it uh, samples certain textures. And this is a master, so this is only the default. And then in the instance material, go in this one. Here I add the actual textures. So this shader can be used also in a, a different project of mine where I don't want this stone, but I can just swap it out for a different stone or a different kind of moss. That way I can also reuse stuff for later projects. And it makes your workflow uh, faster as well. And then Wait, there was already a question about this, I think, in the chat. I read it before, but somebody, and I had it in my notes as well. Like, when do I decide to create a shader that's for like bigger props? And it mostly comes down to uh, how close it is to the camera and if the texel density can still hold up to that. For instance, if this was only the camera view and I needed something in the background and the player could never get there, then I would not even bother to work with that kind of shader, but just slap a tonic texture on it because you won't see it that close. It's only a few pixels. But this one here, for instance, if a player could walk here, it could go really close. And that's why this one has that shader with the RGB mask. And that's this one. So this is even more complicated. <laughs> but it's the same kind of philosophy again, like base textures goes into a material attributes and then the blending goes here. With shaders it's mostly just thinking logical and what you want to do and creating it step by step. And this one instead of uh, vertex paint, it uses a mask. So in every channel there's a black and white mask and that determines where the moss is, where the dirt is, or where the base texture is. And as you can see, here only the, I can only swap out the base textures, and it's also on purpose, so I don't have a whole list of stuff here, because I know I want moss, and it's the moss for, for this project, so I just keep that in the, in the master material. So I don't have to add that to every instant material I make. And this is kind of what a RGB mask looks like. See, so you can see every channel is a black and white mask. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think the goal with this uh, workshop is mostly to get the philosophy behind it, and then later you can find a lot of of this on the internet on how to make this. Are your base textures for the escalator there? Are they uniques or are they tileable materials? This you mean? Mm -hmm. These are tileable. Okay. Yeah. Because the uniqueness comes from the mask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is also uh, uh, better to load in. Uh, for instance, if you have a bigger game, you need to load in a lot of textures. Yeah. And if you have multiple bigger props, then all these textures are already loaded in. And maybe the tiling texture as well, because you have multiple metal props, for instance. Then the only texture that needs to be loaded in again is the mask, which is then only one texture, which is super cheap. Mm -hmm. And you can even take this further. Right now, it's just sampling one-to-one -one the black and white values, but you could also add the height lerp we had in, the, in this material. And then you can make a transition phase with a, another noise so you can break up the mask even more and then you're lo then you're also only loading in one extra texture because assuming that every other prop uses the same noise and then for this i also added uh, extra vertex paint on top so because the kind of the theme of this environment is moss and green so i wanted a lot of control on where i could paint stuff for instance this green here it's all painted in It's not, uh, yeah, then I need to repaint again, for instance. And Paul, you also asked about uh, the AO map stuff, mm -hmm. which is a neat little trick I did for uh, my basic uh, moss texture here, or shader. So, so how, this, how this shader is built up is like dust is on top, then this is the dust position, then this is the moss. And the moss is, uh, I just paint with a vertex paint. But how how this moss is, uh, I made it so that I used the AO map, which, which is, uh, how do I explain this? Which is a black and white mask, and in faces or in normals that are close to each other, it's darker, and where it's not, it's lighter. But you can use this information to sample a texture, for instance. So what I did here is my OMAP is in the blue channel here. Then I revert it so the black becomes white. Because white is where you want stuff and the white becomes black. And then I you added uh, a dirt mask here, clamp it, and then you use that as a height lerp, like I explained. You can use this as a transition. And how that looks in practice is kind of like this. Uh, let me get a fresh one because this one is already painted on. So you can imagine that behind these bars, there's AO because it's close to the other face. And then go into, yeah, for this one, I also, as you can see, I use this one. The, normally you wouldn't do this because you also want to use the other the other channels but for this one I just use this to make and make it easier for myself then I don't have to click here just go in here super low strength I can kind of go in here as you can see there's more moss it's it's kind of subtle but it's more than moss sampling on the on where the stuff meets than in the middle, because there's less ambient occlusion here. Mm -hmm. And in this one, it's super subtle, but if you have one that is like more dark, for instance, if I paint here, you can kind of see how it creeps up here. This one is used for uh, every everything where you see moss, this trick is used. So also it gets more into the things here it's super subtle but i think the de these details really can lift up your environment a little bit definitely so that's the ao oh yeah and then this is not shader related but i wanted to show how i go about 
speeding up the process a little bit more. And then mostly comes down to duplicating or reusing uh, stuff in a smart way. So for instance, I have this uh, traffic barrel here. So this is one traffic barrel, but I, I made three versions. So one that is damaged and one that's laying on the ground. So now I already have three assets that are kind of different. And this is like a super easy example, but a more better one is maybe this one. So I made this uh, these shelves. And then later I cut one of the shelves out and just put it on the floor. So I have another asset. And you can do this with all kinds of stuff. Same for the ceiling here. First I made a one that is like four by four. And then I made a lot of variations. And this way you can easily populate and make, uh, make variations and stuff. I guess that aspect of what you're talking about is, you know, much more important in production and something that maybe a lot of students aren't familiar with or aware of, that whole sort of reusability and mm -hmm. efficiency yeah, drive. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Not only for a time's sake, but also for uh, loading times. Because like I said, this texture is loaded already. And this is literally using the same kind of texture, so. Mm-hmm. But I think even for students, if you want to cut down on time for your uh, your assignments, it's a good way to do it as well. Yep. And I, th I mean, this is kind of fast. This is kind of what I wrote down. No, that's that's great as an overview. I've been looking at this environment a lot recently myself, and just going through it and trying to analyze different approaches and stuff. Um, we have got lots of questions, Martin. If you want to, like. Um, maybe start with those and maybe answer these as best you can um I'll start the, going through them. yeah they're on the chat above here right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i can call them yeah. out to you to make it easier for you so there's start with jenny um so the first question relates to how you block out your environment so did you block this out in unreal engine or was this blocked I, out in something like blender or other so yeah, this one is interesting because uh, I kind of blocked it out with uh, the modular pieces I made. Mm -hmm. Let's save it now. So kind of, I mean, these look already better than when I started. When I started, it was just a wall. And this was the shape. And then with these shapes, I blocked out the space. So I did that. I made these in Blender. Mm -hmm. And then I imported them in here. And then I just made the space with that. So no blocks in, in Real Engine. And the same for these. So these were first just a block, a block on the size I wanted it to be, and just put them down here. And then later I can update this mesh to make it look better. Okay. Have so you kind of doing the block out and the art at the same time. Right. Okay. Um, have you used the modeling tools at all? Was this done in 427? Uh, no, no, this five. is... Uh, this is 422. 422, okay. Yeah, you, you the reason for that... <laughs> no. No. No, the reason for that is that this is... Uh, the main goal is, is to make this for the real marketplace. Mm -hmm. And people there are like lower versions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. okay. that's why I'm still old school here. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, yeah. Second question from Jenny is about foliage. Um, just maybe talk a little bit about how you approach foliage design and, and placement within your scene. I think your a lot of your scenes have very strong foliage elements in them mm -hmm. uh, yeah so maybe talk a little bit about your your thought process behind foliage yeah yeah i saw, I saw this question as well like where the sun hits and stuff i do kind of think about that like when the sun goes through here like of course there will not be any green in these corners because there is no sunlight there so that is one aspect but then also a bigger one is uh composition you can kind of i feel like you can kind of bend the rules if it makes sense of nature mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> sounds very dramatic mm -hmm. but uh, i mean in in the end we're making art so i don't think we have to follow nature 100 percent all the time yep so if i can use foliage to frame stuff better then i'll for sure use that and another thing i uh it's kind of i learned this when i 
started at uh, Ubisoft. So if you look at this, a lot of the foliage is connected. If you go like this. So my, my idea behind this is that it started on top, kind of went down here and just spread out. Right. Yeah, there's like I a think pattern. It's, yeah, yeah it's, it's all connected. If I just had a random grass growing here in the middle of nowhere, that, that would look, just look weird. Okay. When you connect it like this, it also helps with composition and readability. As you can see, yep. places to rest your eyes here. You can see kind of a path. Yeah, pulls the eye through the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you create these foliage elements like yourself, or do you use speed tree, or how, how do you do that sort of process? These, uh, these I make myself. Okay. I just go on on hikes or just take a photo of these leaves. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah, because okay. yeah, because like I said, this is all made for the marketplace, and then I cannot use any any stuff I did not make myself. So okay. kind of have to, yeah. which is kind of fun as well to not use mega scans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and final one from Jenny is about graffiti. Um, you use quite a lot of graffiti in your work. Uh, do you utilize Substance Designer for making that, or how do you, how do you go about sort of the graffiti elements in your scene? Yeah, I I think I opened up. Oh yeah, I opened up this scene as well to show a bit more as well. So I think she's talking about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is mainly just me on the couch on my iPad, just <laughs> doodling away. <laughs> no, nothing uh, sophisticated about this, and that's kind of with all the graffiti I do. And these are when just it comes decals. to just decals. yeah, these are decals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But when it comes to uh, stuff like this, yeah, these kind of decals is all a substance designer. Yeah. Cool. Um, so you create most of that stuff yourself then? Okay. Yeah. Um, next question, questions come from Joe. Um, I think you've kind of touched on this a little bit already. How do you plan for shader requirements when you're starting out a project? Yeah. Um, that that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So, like I explained here, I I try to keep it as simple as possible and as basic for my first one. And that one, I can do most of what I want to. Like I think eighty percent of what you see here is made with that one shader. And then the requirements for the project is like, do I have water in there? Is there rain? Those kind of questions answer what kind of shaders I need to make. Or do I have do I want moving a uh, cloth or moving flags yeah and, and then guess... based on that oh. sorry sorry go ahead no you go on and based on that i decide what kind of shaders i need to make but it all stems for the from the one basic shader mm -hmm. i guess the good thing about that as well is whenever you create these for the first time there's a lot of reuse like you yeah. have a library to tap into um when you go to your next project which is always good yeah um Joe's second question is about modularity. Uh, so you use a lot of modular kits. Uh, how do you go about breaking up sort of repetition? And how do you get the UV seams to match up correctly between your modular pieces? Um, so let me start with the repetition stuff. For this one, it's... Uh, this texture is already not very repetitive, the the tiles itself. And then to break it even more, I made a mask to have these leaks here. And you can kind of see, oh, this also answers the UV seams. The seam is right in the middle of a black line, so it's hard to see. And that's kind of the, the idea behind modularity. Always try to keep your seams in places where you will never see them. So. In this instance, the texture hides it, but in most cases, it will be that you add this kind of stuff. Oh, where did that go? To kind of hide it, if I didn't have that seam. Yeah, the old classic pillar. Yeah. Yeah. But you can, you don't necessarily have to do that, but it's really tricky to get it right if you want to align the seams 100%. And then it's just 
in your uh, 3D package, just getting the UVs from uh, left to right, exactly on the right uh, mm -hmm. location. Matching up perfectly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, next question uh, relates to your Ali project. So as you know, um, some of my students are using your Ali scene as inspiration mm -hmm. for their environment module this year. And I think Cameron is sort of asking about sort of background assets. So yeah. I think in that scene, there's like, um, there's sort of like fog. Oh, you have it here, do you? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw this question, so I, you I found it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you preferred. Uh, yeah. So he was just, I think it's about composition and more so, mm -hmm. I guess, how you deal with elements that are far off in your renders or like what sort of attention do you need to give to things that are very far away from the camera? Yeah, that's a, also a good question. That's just ma mainly just silhouettes and a uh, basic color. I, if I think if I do I hope it doesn't crash. There's a lot of pink stuff in here because it lost connections. Mm -hmm. It kind of can kind of show. Suspense. <laughs> drama <laughs> but that's yeah that's mainly a lot of reuse of what i use in the foreground All right and then like these longer pillars are it's just because it's a lot of fog and you don't see it up close it only needs silhouette then it's just modeling it out oh here we go it's blender you can see fresh. like yeah. mm -hmm. no <laughs> very stable <laughs> As you can see, there's you cannot see any texture definition on these things. Yeah. Just so a basic color would do the job. And I think, I mean, this is a long time ago since I made this. Yeah. Here I did some textures on the walls, but this one, it, it just, it's just a color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same for the cables. This one as well. There's no wood texture on this one. Yeah. All silhouettes. So those elements that are further away don't really need the same care and attention that the camera no. does stuff. Yeah. Okay. No, as you can see here, these cables all have these kind of little yeah, metal bindings and stuff. Yeah. yeah. It still looks so good. This is like what five years old? I think four. Four years old. Yeah. Something like yeah. this was when the, when Evie was still in beta and Blender. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Still Lots looks, of crashes. Still looks amazing. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, next question is from Nyla. Um, how do you go about creating environments when you aren't using a concept or reference? What do you think is the best thing for artists to do to grow their artistic brains that isn't making art? I think there's two questions there. So the first one is, yeah. how do you go about creating environments when you're not, so when you don't have a concept or you don't have good reference to work from, how do you maybe approach those scenarios? Um, well, it almost never happens that you don't have references. Mm -hmm. So if there's no concept, then I just think about what in what kind of world does this environment fit? Yeah. And then what kind of location is it? A, I mean, most of my stuff is uh, all of my stuff is real world locations, so it makes it super easy. Yeah. Because then you can find a lot of re references. I think Nyla's working on uh, a scene like a sci-fi. Yeah. So it's a, a little bit harder, obviously, when you don't have the, you know, reality to tap into. Yeah. So, yeah. Any any ideas or suggestions about how you would approach things like that if you were to work on something that wasn't real world based? Uh, yeah, think about the bigger world of where, you, where your location or where your environment is based in mm -hmm. and look for references that fit that vision, I think. Yeah. I guess you could watch films and... Read yeah, other, read other media and stuff as well. It'd be really useful. Um, yeah, you can use references from different kind of sci-fi movies to yeah. get inspired. Yeah, combine elements so it doesn't look like it's from that particular movie. Cool. Uh, and I think I know the answer to this now, or at least I know one of the things that you're going to say for this next one. But <laughs> other things that you can do um, that don't involve making art that that it, that's good for your artistic brain. Yeah, as photography, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That uh, that helped me a lot with uh, getting better at composition and lighting. Yeah, we we introduced photography. We have a photography module on our game program, 
um, just for that reason, because I think it's just such a a core skill to learn about framing and composition yeah. and arrangement of objects and stuff in a scene. Yeah, for sure. So, it helps a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then playing games. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're making game art in the end, so that yeah. helps. Cool. No, the students are going to love that you said that, Martin. They're going <laughs> to be very happy right now. Yeah. Um, Jojo's next. What do employees look for when people are applying for junior art positions? Well, that's a that's a big wide topic, but some yeah. key, some key pointers about what what you might consider or what you think are the key things that maybe are important for a junior artist to junior environment artist to sort of demonstrate they have. Uh, I think the the biggest thing is potential. Mm -hmm. If if I see their portfolio and. and I, I kind of need to be impressed, and then I see like I, I, we can we can learn this this person a lot because he already shows a lot of potential. Okay, so not necessarily a master of any given thing, but just that they they have an interest and they have an enthusiasm. And they've they've demonstrated some ability. Yeah, I think one great portfolio piece is, does already do that. Mm -hmm. If you have one that is like super, I mean, we've hired people that only have one super stunning piece. Right, yeah. and that shows because that's that's made usually your latest piece, and that just shows your potential. If you just made that, then yeah, you, we can take it further. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, Stephen is next. Um, could you talk us through your decision making process 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 when deciding what technique is going to be used for a particular prop? So, for example, uh, when we would use masks, secondary UVs, face with it, normal sculpting. So I mm -hmm. guess the question relates to the decision-making process behind yeah. how you approach propping. Yeah. Uh, most of that is comes to the, down to how close will this prop be to the camera? That's the fundamental question. So if it is a piece that's on a rooftop, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on making a secondary UVs and uh, doing all that extra detail stuff because you will never get close to it. But if it is a rooftop piece where there's a level on the rooftop, then it would go and go into the tiling textures and UV maps and RGB masks and all that stuff. Do you think it's wrong, Martin, for like, obviously, like from a production perspective and, and obviously in a lot of your work, and this is something we do cover, um, certainly at our uni with students, things like um, tiling, trim sheets and, you know, non-unique texture workflows, masks. Um, do you think it's wrong or, or disadvantages a, a student in any way if if they don't have that on their portfolio if they're doing everything as a unique a, a unique texture? Uh, well, I don't think it's necessarily wrong, but mm -hmm. I think it's it's really good to know those different workflows because mm -hmm. a unique texture is uh, isn't used. I mean, the way we work at Massive isn't used that much. It's mostly all tiling textures and masks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's, I don't think it's wrong necessarily because, I mean, I got a job only doing unique textures. <laughs> so. Okay, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so it's definitely it's... good if you can show that uh, you know the other the workflows. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, couple of questions from Daniel. Um, so I think some of these relate to narrative. Um, yeah. any, any advice or tips about establishing narrative in your scene? I guess lighting comes into that as well, to some degree. Yeah. Um, so your thoughts on that? Like this, this looks very to me straight away, and I'm, I guess it's probably one of the inspirations you had. Very Last of Us, very like post-apocalyptic. Yeah. Um. So how do you how do you approach narrative visual storytelling in your in your games in your environments? Yeah, that's a. It's a, a big deep, question. Deep question. <laughs> yeah, I think my other one there's uh, this. Literally, the only the only narrative in this one is I wanted to make a mall that looks abandoned and cool. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> but this one is a more sophisticated idea behind it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the narrative here is that uh, this is like the broad narrative. Of what happened in the world is that there's a zombie apocalypse. Like I mean, this is also Last of Us inspired. Mm -hmm. And then they all slept into the they all slept here in the basketball court. Yeah, you can see the beds here. Yeah. And then later there was like a flooding or uh, some some disaster happened, which <laughs> broke the room into two, and that's when all the green came in. Right. So. 
So right. that's like the bigger narrative. And then with those elements, you can do a lot of moving stuff around. Like you can see that this is on top of the stuff in there because it happened later. Yeah. I guess and how. Sorry, Martin, going ahead. Yeah, you, you can get to you. <laughs> um, I guess it's sort of, in a lot of your scenes, like I think back to the theater environment and a few other things that I've looked at that you've done, like there's always there's always pointers towards like things like the location. So like where in mm -hmm. the world we are, there's always yeah. some indication of like, of the time, the, like this, the sort of the current date, like a lot of these like, like modern current timed pieces. Um, and then obviously there's the story, like things like the graffiti, the decals, like they build in a lot of little narrative elements as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. All those little details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and another thing I wanted to, now that you mentioned this one, mm -hmm. what I wanted to, to say about the narrative, I always think about, and I think as, last time I also told your students this, that if you make a narrative in an environment, think in steps yeah. and where it impacts stuff. So here, the, I mean, can we, I don't have this one open, so I hear this one is yeah. broken into. Mm -hmm. And then the, the what happens after is that the, the foliage grows into, but there's also a pile of dirt here. And you can see it is also the ceiling is broken here, but uh, and what happens then is that it falls onto the seats here, which are broken as well. And then there's a lot of stuff down here as well, so it's all connected. And that's what I try to yeah, convey in the environment that stuff never happens on its own; it's always, always connected with each other. Yeah, the cause and effect type. Yeah. Scenario. Yeah. Um. And then I guess in building a portfolio, so if somebody wants to become an environment artist, um, sort of, you were saying like one piece can be enough, but like, are, are there, do you need more than that? Like, do, do you think having more than that can be beneficial? So if, if people have an environment and maybe they have like some substance designer materials or like, yeah, do, do you think that can be advantageous for, for people to have sort of demonstrating more than just environment? you know, one piece type thing. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's maybe even better if you can show that you used your substance designer material in your environment, because then you show that you know, uh, how do you say that? That you can make stuff and also use it, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, implement it, yeah, yeah. Implement it, yeah. Because mm -hmm. okay. most of the substance designer stuff, uh, like it's like the balls, it's like, these are super nice renders always, yeah. but you never see it used in context. Yeah. So putting it into practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then big, medium, small props. I guess that's just about prop balance. So you've got like a nice distribution. Like a lot of your scenes have, have that, I think. Like you've got like your larger structural elements and then you have like containers yeah. and little small details as well. Yeah. The stuff all, all comes down to a noise and a rest space for your eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's... I don't really have a technique for that. I think it kind of comes with experience, mm -hmm. but it's mostly just, I mean, I also said this last time, I kind of work in islands. So this is like yeah. a big propping island, lots of details, and then it spills out into smaller ones. And then there's nothing. So here's where your eyes can rest and maybe where the player knows so I can walk here. Yeah. And then it's all just stuff together. Maybe just explain <laughs> what you mean by a, a prop island. I know because you, you told me last time, but for, people who maybe weren't at your previous talk or haven't encountered that term because i think that was a really interesting idea for me like the whole idea yeah. of arranging things in a certain way yeah so how do you how do you explain it again it's it's basically like stuff accumulates together i mean i don't think it necessarily happens in the real world i think if you have this in the real world <laughs> it would look super uh, noisy and you don't know where to go but we're making video games in the end so we don't always adhere to the real world. So what I then do is make these islands of details and props that you can see here. And I think it's even more clear here. So all the stuff comes here out of the shop. I mean, the propping islands, they need to make sense as well. So they're all, all stuff that comes out of the shop. And that way you create space for the player to walk to. And it's it helps you with the composition as well. And I think in the... This one, there's some good examples as well. You can see here. 
and here's a little island. Yeah, little clusters of of detail. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It just helps with the readability of the of the space. Cool. And that's uh, like a super easy technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to make your environments. I keep repeating myself, but more readable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just no, shove, shove stuff together, and then <laughs> that helps a lot already. I think that's important. Readability is definitely a big, a big thing. Um, okay. Um, two questions from Salvador. Uh, we've kind of touched on foliage a little bit before. Any specific tips? Do you go through sort of the like? Do you sculpt in ZBrush and? Oh yeah. Yeah. So you make a lot of things handmade, you were saying, because obviously you need to sell these things on the on the marketplace. Yeah, but I don't do the sculpting stuff. I just okay. mm -hmm. go on hikes and take photos of leaves. Right. And then yeah. and then I painstakingly take out the background. Okay. And if you do that a few times you have a few plants or a few leaves. And then it's just Yeah, creating the, the plant. I think there's a lot of resources on how to do this. Mm -hmm. But it's basically just planes shaped as a leaf and then shoved together. And it becomes a plant. And of course, you need to look at references as well. But it's all from photo textures. So your flowers and all your foliage are all from photo textures? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Either with my DSLR or just my iPhone when I don't have it with me. Mm -hmm. Wow. They look really cool. Really nice. Um, and creating custom collisions for meshes. How do you go about creating custom collisions for meshes? So I... I try to avoid that whenever I can, mm -hmm. but uh, for this one, uh, there is some that you cannot. For instance, if you have door openings, the collision from Unreal always blocks it because it goes by a bounding box. Or this one, the railing needs to be, maybe we can show it here. Where is this thing, collision? There we go. Yeah, the player needs to walk in between these. But how I go about it is just making boxes and going around the geometry. Or is this person asking ex exactly how to make it in a reel? Or more the um, idea behind it? How do you go about creating custom collisions for the meshes? I'm not entirely sure, but I, th I think it's more about the idea behind it. Yeah. I'm sure you could find that. If they, yeah, more the idea, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... Yeah, I try to avoid it when I can, but when I cannot, I just try to work in boxes because that's also how Unreal likes it, just separate boxes. You cannot make this in one because yeah. then it would be just one big and then player cannot walk underneath here. Yeah. Okay. And mainly door openings and stuff where you know the bounding box is going over, over your mesh where you don't want it. Okay, cool. Um, Helena has a question. Uh, so going back a little bit to the reference concept idea, do you do you work from reference or concept in the scene that you're currently showing off, or how do you go about deciding what kind of environment you want to build and how you want it to look? So I I guess idea generation, inspiration. Where does all mm -hmm. that come from? Uh, mainly from. So there's a few things. So this, of course, came from The Last of Us. That's just because I recently played it again, and then I was like, yeah, I want to make something like that for myself again. And then I'm currently working on a uh, more cyberpunk scene, and that mainly came from uh, Unreal Engine 5 and the capabilities of Lumen. Mm -hmm. And then the idea behind that one was just to, to push that okay. and see what I could do with that. And just, because I never, I mean, I made a cyberpunk scene before, but I never really pushed it in a real engine, so it was like a nice and new challenge for me. Yeah. And what is it? If the scene is showing off for this one. Yeah. I, I always use references. You cannot make anything that is grounded in the real world without references. So did this come from like an actual shopping mall that you've been to, or is this like more like research you've done online or Yeah, this one is from uh several shopping malls okay. that are abandoned in the US. I think maybe I can find the mirror board quickly. Mm -hmm. I think you're go. a mirror fan as well. Yeah. All right, this is this is not the biggest board. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, you can see this is straight from The Last of Us. Yeah. And then these are concepts from The Last of Us again. And this one is not. But this is kind of the vibe. And these are photos from people that just go to abandoned malls, take photos there. Wow, that's really cool. There's something really, I don't know if it's just me or not, but I, I love abandoned spaces. Yeah. I think they're just really visually interesting. I think it's the whole nature reclaiming the space type idea. Um, yeah. I mean, I love it too. <laughs> yeah, 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 I get that. Okay. I think this was the main reference. You can see the yeah the sort of the shapes here, the two floors and stuff. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay, uh, next question is I think a straightforward one because I think you posted this on Twitter uh, fairly recently. It's about a console command, I believe. How do mm -hmm. you achieve uh, that crisp, sharp look in your scene? Like, is it a post processing material? Yeah, so there there is a material you can make in the post processing, but. Uh, to me, that just doesn't look good enough because it has kind of like a white line around the things. Mm -hmm. So what I do to make uh, crisp screenshots is the console command, which is the tone mapper sharpen. This one is sharpened by three, but if I bring it to zero, I don't think you can see it on the stream even. Maybe you can. You can see a little blur, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of looks like we need glasses here. So if you do this, then this so that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I do the screen percentage to 200 while I make a screenshot. So this doubles the amount of pixels that are cramped into the to the screen. Do you do any post process in Photoshop with any of your renders or is it just in Unreal Engine? Uh, just Unreal Engine because I wanted to make it true as the people that download it on the Unreal Marketplace eventually yeah. that it's the same as the pictures they saw. Okay. Uh, awesome. Cool. Ask that question. But I want to say on that as well, like if you're making just a portfolio piece, I think there's no harm in going in Photoshop and doing post processing in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Um, the next one's about variation. Um, I think we've, we've done the inspiration stuff already, but like you've talked a little bit about RGB masks and secondary UVs. Um, any other yes. ideas or suggestions of useful things to look at for variation? Shane is uh, one of my students and he's looking at variation for like his final project. Um, yeah. How to, how to basically break things up and make them varied through shaders and different, different bits and pieces. So he's looking at RGB masking already and he's looking at secondary UVs, but are there any other suggestions or things that you think would be useful to look at in relation to um, variation? Uh, so you can, I, I haven't used it in this uh, project because I also recently learned that, mm -hmm. but in real has a thing where you can uh, make a rule based on location in the world. Ah, yes. So if you, I think I saw this on Twitter, maybe the person is in the Discord as well, but I think it was from a art station Learning. course by Clinton Klumper, yep. and he talked, talked mm -hmm. about the uh, color variation based on location. Yeah, I think it uses object position. Yeah, object position, yeah. which is a, a really cool trick to do that. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. And then I, I don't know on the top of my head how to set it up right now, but... No, no, that's fine. That's fine. We can look at that. Um, yeah, and the other variation is, like I talked about already, the make one prop and then make it damaged. You have another prop. Yeah. And you can do the same for foliage. So this is this is one. But if I just take this into Blender, make the shape a little bit different, maybe a little bit bigger, then I have another variation already. Yeah. I think that's a really good idea, actually, just having some like prop variation for some of your key elements. It just yeah. breaks up the repetition that you normally get with things looking the same. Yeah, and, uh, and it says it's kind of like cheating because you already made a prop. Yeah. You can maybe even damage this one, like there's some rock falling off. I don't know. Then you have a different variation already. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think we've covered repetition already. Um, so that question I think is also kind of answered. We've talked about breakup and use of decals and the secondary UVs and masks. So I think we've done that as well. Uh, Ian has a question. Uh, because this is Unreal, oh, sorry, because this is for the Unreal Marketplace, did you create LODs for all your objects? Do you rely on auto loading or do you create your own LODs? Uh. I think for this one, I didn't create any lots. Okay. Because that's not a requirement for the real marketplace. Okay. 
So everything and, is just lot zero. Yeah. Yeah. And when people actually want to use it, they maybe maybe they use simply gone or use the Unreal generation. Mm -hmm. But I mean, making lots is can be a lot of work and hassle, and yeah. kind of takes the fun out of it. So if I don't have to do it, I don't do it. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, I guess also for well for marketplace it might be different but for a lot of students a lot of the spaces they create won't be necessarily playable spaces no. um you know so they're gonna they'll be in control of camera distance and mm -hmm. where cameras go and stuff so it's not as um you know as important as maybe it would be if it was in for a production scenario yeah. um yeah you would yeah. you would kind of say that if you're making a portfolio piece to yeah to not make it look like a game environment necessarily yeah because if you sometimes see those screenshots from uh games that are released it kind of kind of looks artificial where stuff is placed that's just for the gameplay yeah so kind of keep that in mind true okay yeah so there's a difference between a playable space versus a portfolio space portfolio yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah. you also need to show that you know the fundamentals of uh, composition and color and light and you cannot always do that when it is a gameplay space awesome cool um, I think that's everything, Martin. Um, we've covered a lot of questions. You've, you've went through a lot of different bits and pieces. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's always um, very insightful and educational when, when we have a conversation. I know students will find a lot of these things very, very useful. Um, Roxy has just posted a link to your art station in the workshop chat. So if anyone oh, yeah. isn't following Martin, then definitely drop him a follow. He's a fantastic artist. You'll find them on Twitter as well. Um, Thank you, man. The, I think it's the same. Martin Hoff is your Twitter? Martin J. Hoff. Martin, Martin. Hoff was already taken. Oh, God. Okay. Martin yeah, J. Hoff. Sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you can you can find Martin on, on Twitter as well. But a phenomenal artist and just great inspiration. You've always been very, very supportive of, of our students as well. And indeed, students in general. Your art station, or sorry, your Unreal Marketplace content is super educational the packs and environments that you've made are very very good so appreciate all that you do martin thank you man that's uh good to hear <laughs>